Hi, so this is the very first part of the That Makes Sense online presentation, and this is going to cover what is sensory processing. So in this section, we're going to think about what we mean when we talk about the senses. What is sensory processing and how does it affect us? We're going to think a little bit about different kinds of sensory needs just to introduce those at that point. Um, the main thing we're going to think about in this section is about children who might over respond to sensation or under respond to sensation. Um, and then that will lead to behaviours that we might see, such as children who do something called sensory seeking and sensory avoiding. So in this presentation, we're going to be thinking mainly about sensory processing and what that means. But in order to understand sensory processing, we need to understand what we mean by the different senses. So when we're thinking about sensory information, there's five main senses that most of us are aware of. So those are our sense of touch, um, our eyesight, our hearing, our sense of taste and our sense of smell. Um, in one of the next presentations, we're going to be covering something that we've called the special senses as well. So these are more unusual senses that you don't hear about every day, but actually are really important when children and young people do have sensory processing difficulties. So the first one of those is something called body awareness, um, and that's our awareness of how we move. We're also going to be thinking a little bit about our movement and our balance sense. Um, and the last sense that we're going to introduce in the um, in the special senses unit is something called interoception, um, which is a, a big word. It basically means being aware of internal sensation. So what is sensory processing? The term so sensory processing um, is basically just used to describe how our brain uses information from all of the different senses. It helps us understand what's happening around us what we need to do, how our bodies are moving, and how we're feeling. And every, every minute, every second, our senses are detecting millions and millions of sensations and sensory messages. And if we don't want to end up completely swamped and overloaded, like the person in the picture, we need these messages to be sorted out, um, prioritised into what's important and what isn't, um, and ignored, depending on how important they are. So this lets us know what's happening, it helps us to do the everyday things that we need to do, and it also helps to keep us safe. So I want to think a little bit about whether messages are helpful or not helpful. So in this chart, we've got on the left hand side, messages that are really urgent that we need to do something about straight away. In the middle, we've got sensory messages that are useful that we do need to use but maybe not immediately. And on the right hand side, we've got sensory messages that are not really very helpful. So for the first one, if we're in the road and there's an oncoming car rushing towards us, we need to do something about that straight away in order to survive. If we are going to meet somebody, we need to be able to find them and spot them if it's crowded and there's a lot of people. But unless we're doing a really, really deep clean we don't really need to see tiny little specks of fluff on our carpet. And the same goes with the other senses as well. So, you know, if we've got a sudden really severe pain, we need to take action straight away. Um, again, even if we've got, if we can feel a pebble in our shoe, we need to do something about it. If we didn't, we might get a blister or a, we might uh, you know, hurt, get a, a pain on our foot. But again, just things like the feeling of our clothes brushing against our arm, we don't really need uh, to know about that. So when we've got sensory processing difficulties, sometimes our priorities can get muddled. And so things that are not important are the things that we notice straight away. And the really important messages are the things that we're not picking up on. So in this slide, this is just introducing different types of sensory needs. In this presentation, we're going to be looking at the information on the left hand side of the slide most of the time, um, but I want to talk about it all just very briefly. So we need to look at this slide from the middle out. So if we can see at the top where it says information from the senses, and then that goes down and it's got touch, vision, sound, taste, etc. On the left hand side of the slide, it shows what happens when we have difficulty getting the message from our senses. And on the right hand side of the slide, it shows what happens when we get the message from our senses, but then our brain um, struggles to make use of that information. So on when we have difficulty getting the message, 
that's when we might either under or over respond to sensation. So either we're noticing too much of things that we don't need to know about that's not important, or we're not getting important messages, we're under responding to sensation. This is what we're going to be talking about for the majority of the presentation. But I just want us to be aware as well, by looking at the right hand side, that sometimes um, sensory needs can cause difficulty as well with things like coordination, with posture and balance. Some children who have difficulty using the message will have difficulty coming up with new play ideas. It's a planning difficulty, planning if they've got to um, follow new movements, they find it really hard to do that, or they find it hard to come up with new play ideas and tend to play the same things again and again. And again, they might just have difficulty with uh, sort of physical coordination difficulty with everyday tasks. So they might struggle to do things like ride a bike or to use a knife and fork and that sort of thing. So there's four different ways that we tend to react to sensation. And I'm going to talk about those over the next few slides. So what um, children and young people tend to do is either under respond to sensation, um, and that's when they're not noticing the messages that they need, or they over respond to sensation. And that's when they're noticing everything, even the things that aren't important. And then what they do about that depends on whether they tend to seek sensation or avoid sensation. So we'll, we'll explain that in a little bit more detail over the next few slides. So somebody who's an under responder is somebody who is not picking up on those important sensory messages. So it might be that they don't notice the sensory messages at all, or there's a bit of a delay and it seems to take them a really long time to notice those sensory messages, or they might only pick up on um, messages that are really, really strong sensations. And again, how this might affect them, they might seem really tired, they might seem quite zoned out, because again, if you don't get the sensory information, it can affect your, your alertness levels. A lot of children who under respond take a lot longer to get their bearings if they go, either they stop an activity and start a new one, or if they go from one environment or one room to another um, space, it just takes them a lot longer to work out where they are, what's going on, get their bearings. And another thing is why you can't see the words very well because of my uh, the little the little screen with me on. A lot of children who under respond. Um, they struggle to find a lot of activities meaningful. So the example it gives there is if you can't really taste chocolate, you're not going to really be bothered about eating it. And it's in the same, that effect, that is the same, it rings true for other things as well. So if you don't really feel the sensation of movement very well, you're not going to be bothered about going to the park and riding on the swings. If you can't really uh, you know, hear things get most, if you can't get the most from your sense of hearing you're not going to be bothered about listening to music that sort of thing so depending on what they maybe don't pick up those things might not be as meaningful to them or be something that they're wanting to do as much so on the other hand if we've got over responders these are the people who just notice everything so they're overwhelmed with too much sensory information and they find it really, really hard to ignore those messages that are unhelpful. They can't help but pick those up. And again, as the picture we saw before, if you've got that much information coming at you, your brain can't handle it. You become overwhelmed and overloaded with sensation. So something that we quite often see from people who become overwhelmed with sensation is either they become quite anxious or again, they might have quite a short fuse because you can only handle so much. And then just one more thing, and that's when you're going to have a big a big meltdown and what we find as well is some children um, and young people might you know they might be bothered by little sensory triggers throughout the school day so they might be bothered by the feel of their uniform the smell of dinner cooking and um, the sound of people shuffling their books in the background where they kind of mask that and they hold it together until they're home and they feel comfortable where they can let everything go and that's when you might see a big meltdown when somebody gets home from school having held it together all day. So when we think about children who've got sensory over responding, um, one of the big issues that they have is that they have to cope with just having too much sensory information to handle um, a lot of the time. So I want us here just to think a little bit about what that might actually be a little bit like. Um, and actually sometimes just simple everyday tasks can become really quite difficult 
are frustrating when you can't filter out that background noise um, or that excess visual information. So on the next slide, we've got a little video. Uh, I want you to try and solve the catchphrases that are on there. We've added lots of extra noise and also some extra visual effects just to give you this idea of how much harder things are when you've got just that bit too much sensory information. The answers are on the following slide afterwards. If you are a little bit sensitive to noise, you might want to sit this one out because it is a, we've on purpose made it a little bit too much. But if not, try and watch it without turning the volume down if you can. Okay, so I hope that wasn't too traumatic for you. Here are the answers. So for number one, the answer is top secret. For number two, the answer is big fish in a small pond. For number three, the answer is blood is thicker than water. For number four, the answer is head over heels. Uh, number five is thinking outside the box. Then the next one is a fork in the road. Then we've got first aid, undercover cop, and life after 40. So as we can see from the video, people who are sensory avoiders are, are sensitive to sensation. They really struggle to ignore that unhelpful information. So all of the little things that are happening in the background that you don't notice at all when you are not sensitive to sensory become very, very much at the foreground when you are. Um, so you're very, very sensitive to that sensory information. So by avoiding, using avoiding behaviours and strategies, it's a way of just trying to limit how much information you're getting. So we quite often find that children who are um, sensory sensitive and therefore avoid sensation really like to feel in control of situations um, and that's a way that they feel that they can cope if they feel they've got the control. They also really like things to be very predictable, the same day in day out and that way there's not going to be any sensory surprises, they know exactly what sensations they're going to be facing um, and they're wanting them to be the same every time so there's nothing new because they've already got enough enough of a job trying to cope with the sensations that they usually have without anything else being thrown in the mix. And as we saw at the end of the video, it's really, really common for children who are um, sensitive to panic and go into that fight or flight mode. So he coped for so long, you could see him trying to use a little counting strategy, but it all became too much and he had a meltdown at the end. So on the flip side of this, your sensory seekers are children who under respond to regular levels of sensation. So what they're trying to do, they're not getting all of the sensory messages they need. So they're trying to find ways of getting messages which are either stronger messages, um, more frequent messages or more intense messages. Um, and when messages are like this, they find them much easier to notice and their brains are better able to process and make sense of them. Um, and sometimes as well, it's worth just flagging up that sensory seeking behaviour 
can be subconscious. Children don't always know they're doing it. It's almost like a driver to get the sensation. So if some of the things they're doing to get a sensation can be a little bit irritating and you tell them to stop, they're not always aware that they're doing it. For example, humming. You know, some children might hum because they need a bit more sound. They really don't know they're doing it. So when they're told not to, they're really surprised. Um, so just to summarise, and sensory seeking, it kind of helps to fill the gaps where the sensory information has been missed. But what it's going to look like will really depend, because it's going to depend on which sense it is that they need more information in as to what the behaviour is going to be. So just as here, for example, you know, if they're not getting enough information about movement, um, then that person's going to be very active and on the go. If someone's not getting enough information about sound, they're going to find their own ways to make more noise. Like we were saying, they might hum or make noise in other ways. People who don't get enough information about touch are going to need to touch everything as well as look at it um, and seek out lots of touch experiences as well. So I think the most important thing to mention here is that most children have a mixed pattern of over and under responding in the different systems. So children don't tend to be all over or all under, but they might be over responsive to say noise and touch, but then under responsive to movement and that body position. So this is one of the reasons that sensory can seem quite confusing when you first um, become aware of it and start looking into it because quite often no two people are alike and people can respond one way to one sensation and completely opposite way to a different sensation. And I just want to say here as well, just not to forget that everybody has got some sensory differences and quirks. Um, you know, it's very common for people to sensory seek in subtle ways and it's not something that we need to worry about. It's only when it becomes a problem behaviour or it starts to interfere with our everyday lives. That's when we need to think about it and do something about it. So, for example, on this slide, these are the sorts of things that most people do to get a little bit more sensation. They might, you know, twirl their hair or fiddle with their hair, tap their foot, play with jewellery. Yeah, quite common to tap your pencil, hum along, chew gum, bite your nails. And this isn't something that we'd really worry about at all because, yes, it might be helpful, but it's not causing any problems at all. However, if this were, on the other hand, to be starting to pull hair so hard that it was starting to come out, um, breaking things, kicking people, yelling really hard, um, you know, biting, these are the sorts of behaviours that we would start to worry about because they are starting to be really cause a problem in everyday life. So this brings us to the end of section one. At the end of each section, there is an, um, some ideas for some further reading. So one of the books that we're recommending here is something called Can I Tell You About Sensory Processing Difficulties? And that's by Sue Allen, and that's a really nice um, introduction to sensory processing. And it's got one character who is very under-responsive, or one character who's very over-responsive, um, and you get an idea of the different difficulties that they face. So it might be an idea to take a bit of a screen break now if you want to. And then when you are ready, if you can go back onto that makes sense on YouTube and select part two. Thank you.